Okay, well, welcome everybody. And um, yeah, a really um, a big thanks to CERNET for uh, letting me start early. Um, there are something like 63 slides in this deck. So um, we'll be, um, so strap, strap, strap yourself in. Uh, so this is the inside story on what I'm calling the dollar ticket attack. And um, it's, um, you know, and really what we're, um, what Kerberos um, did to us and what we did to Kerberos in uh, November of 2021. So Kerberos, it's, it's your ticket to privilege. Um, I have one of these um, Kiwis uh, golden ticket uh, stickers on my laptop, having uh, men uh, met uh, very um, uh, over in France with the author of Mimicats. Um, and, yeah, so a, a Kerberos ticket um, is an amazing thing, yet, I'll be talking about them a lot. So I wanted to start by giving you a, um, a picture of one. So here is a, a, a genuine Kerberos ticket as, 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 as found. Um, I'm very thankful to LibreOffice's uh, clip art collection, but it's actually quite serious. The um, Kerberos ticket really is a note with a name on the top of it. Um, and in Windows, that name also has a pack in it. So we've got some SIDs. So you can see there's some SIDs there. Um, and at the bottom, as you can see, it's signed by the KDC. Um, we're going to be talking about Kerberos tickets a lot, and they can be confusing and can have, you know, have, you know, and people can get uh, caught up as to what they might, uh, what might mean. This is what I'm talking about. Uh, think about it mostly in terms of a piece of paper that, that you're passing around with your name on it. And so I wanted to start in particular with a sad part of the story. Uh, because I didn't want this to be the bit that got cut off um, because there's some things I need people to actually to help with and to help spread the word on and to maybe see if we can finish the job because there's still, there is still an unaddressed security weakness in AD. It all comes down to this rather harmless piece of documentation. Given an account in Active Directory with a harmless name like Root Dollar and that name should not be privileged in any way in Active Directory. It's just a username like any other. There is some, there's some trouble that can occur. See, it turns out um, in Active Directory that there is um, a lookup procedure. It's nicely documented. We thank Microsoft for their documentation. And basically what it says is that when you're searching for a user, if you didn't find them in case number one, which is just look them up, you try again and you give the username as given and you append a dollar, which in this case would then find the account. There's also um, uh, further down there, there are, are options to look up an account with its user principal name. This is very convenient in Microsoft's implementation of Kerberos because it's allowed us to have longer more flexible usernames, um, perhaps one that, um, uh, that is your full name or your, what, or your friendly email address compared to your username that has to be stuck under 20 characters and things. It's also case, insensi um, case insensitive, which means you can put your username in in any case you like. The trouble comes from this little bit of the RFC, that the ticket must come back exactly as the, as the user requested. So whatever the user types in is what it gets written on that ticket that I showed you th three slides ago. That's the same username that the target server will see, which means that as an attacker, um, the, um, you can control what the target server sees. Um, except that that would break stuff. Well, it would, it might break things. So Microsoft uh, added a feature um, called canonicalization. And they said that in that case, the server is allowed to reply with a different username at the top of this piece of paper, you know, this, your ticket. And so Windows clients typically set that. A lot of Unix clients set this, which means that as a developer, 
when you're going and you are bleary-eyed, just trying to make bloody Kerberos work, most of the time you see a SAM account name at the top of your ticket, no matter what the user typed in, which means the developer is caught entirely unawares by the fact that the default and RFC behavior is not to. So this is all perfectly safe in a perfect MIT world where only administrators can add and modify users. It all, you know, if, if, the, if the set of, of known aliases is limited, then you can't do too much with this. But adding users and selecting names is not a privileged operation in Windows um, Active Directory. Um, before November 2011, all these things were true. Now, some of them are still true. All users, by default, because of the machine account quota, can select any SAM account name on an account that they can create. So the machine account quota lets you join more machines to the domain. Typically, the group that that quota is attached to is everybody. It can be more restricted. So, um, but by default, it's everybody. And you can select any username you like, as long as it ends in a dollar. And um, in the past, before November, you could also rename that account, uh, which totally avoided all my canonicalize or not attacks. Um, you could just, it wouldn't matter. You, you can call it whatever you want. Um, and so you could also rename it without the dollar. Um, you can also rename the account to match an existing user principal name. And you still can. Um, we, um, I did raise this with Microsoft. I think it got lost in all the noise, um, which gave some really interesting attacks. If you've got someone with a UPN that's less than 20 characters uh, and it ends in a dollar, you could, you know, um, uh, you can, you can um, you know, stop them working. So it's sort of mitigated. Um, there's also the, the big issue that there are, you can have staff that are privileged but not totally privileged in your organisation. I, I, I sort of think of help desk staff and um, you, you've tried to give them least privilege because you're a good organisation, your sysadmins have domain admins and your help desk staff have less than admin enough to do the basic things they needed to do to onboard users and all sorts of things like that. So um, they can set any name that they like, including names that can be sensitive outside Active Directory like admin or root. And MIT Kerberos targets are blind to all of this goings on. Without parsing the pack, the real username is just not provided. And it, if the attacker was a help desk user, then you know there's there's you know uh, there's a problem there too. But I'm particularly concerned that the that about the unprivileged user case. Um, and this is why when we um, did our release in November, we actually had this extra bit saying, you may wish to create an account called root and admin in your domain to make sure that nobody else can create an account of those names. So um, this has implications. So before November 2021, we would, if there wasn't a pack in our ticket, we would fall back to the ticket C name, the name at the top of the ticket that I showed you back on, on slide number two. And so that for a username root dollar, perfectly legitimate to add, would be root. And as a helpful measure, because a lot of people run Unix servers with Unix usernames in, a, in the way that would be friendly to use, where it's bare usernames. Heck, I added the Winbind use default domain code to Samba because it's a nice way to run a server, allows a Samba would fall back from domain slash root to just get PWM of root and log you in as root. NFS, um, and I'm hoping I'm speaking to some um, other people within the storage community here, the ID map for NFS, looking online for the documentation, seems to be often configured for NS switch, which is that you do just cut the front off the principal and look it up. Now that would be, it, NFS will only see the name at the top of the ticket. It doesn't see the pack. It can't see that the username was really root dollar. And so it's gonna to map to it. And I'm really worried about this, but I don't know 
I don't even know who I should be talking to to explain it. And frankly, we got rather exhausted. So we shoved a note at the bottom of our disclosure and kind of hoped that someone might pick it up. Now, that's really crap. So I'm now actually trying to speak to hopefully some people who can help put me in touch with how do we encourage tighter configuration of NFS um, installations. Um, and I also noted a, a note of hope in that I did notice that, um, that Ganesha has a mode where it can ask Winbind uh, for details of the user, which um, then uses the pack and so things are safer there. But I haven't gone and done exploits on this, uh, on these ones, except for the, the top one for Samba. I just know this is how the protocol works and I really would love to work with somebody who would properly exploit it up and show um, and you know, help us get some better guidance out there. Um, but there's also other things to really worry about. SSH, that really scares me. Um, now um, I'm worried about configure some of the SSSD configurations. So it looks like that's um, not as vulnerable by default, but I just, I don't have time to try and build all these things, but I'm hoping if I can raise the concept that this still worries me, that other people can have a go and, you know, and we can maybe work through and try and make some things better. The big problem is that most AD integration in Linux is repurposed stuff from MIT Kerberos. So, and, everyone, and when I go and talk to admins on the Linux side, they say, well, we trust Active Directory. I'm sure they're doing safe things. And I'm just not sure that's always true because an Active Directory administrator never has to consider this. And so there's just this gap in, in the expectations. And I'm trying to sort of talk into that in the hope that we can raise the, raise the issue because we weren't able to come up with a generic, it's just fixed solution to this. But I'm not actually here to talk about um, breaking into Unix clients and things. That, wasn't, that was almost what we didn't fix in our security release. So what did we? Well, we, broke, well, we actually broke Active Directory. 9th of November 2021 was the finish for a very, very long year. Uh, I had really been going at this since um, about that same time the year before. Um, and um, the local cert that I, um, in New Zealand, uh, put out this lovely little article. I gave them a, a, a day's head up and I got a nice little piece of, of um, notice put up, which was, which was nice. The... Um, Microsoft did this with acknowledgements of, um, to Andrew Bartlett of Catalyst IT. Um, and a month later, these tweets, I do thank uh, Alexander Bokovoy, I think, who was the one who pointed these out to us. Um, so it was a really sweaty month between when we said patch, 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 and wrote a reasonably explicit uh, set of advisories. And I was really nervous as to what, how much I was saying and not making this so vulnerable that, that people would have domains busted the next day on the Windows side because there are a lot more of those than there are of Samba. Um, but, yes, 9th of December, security Twitter finally realised what we've been up to. And Cliff Fisher um, is one of the great people at Microsoft um, who uh, I worked with on fixing these things. Um, so... What did I find? Well, I mean, you know, it, it just a casual day at the office. It was only full domain takeover. Um, uh, from any user, any service account, anything in the domain with an account and even on Samba. It wasn't meant to be on Samba. It was, we, this was meant to be a fun story about how Samba was better than that. Um, but... The thing that scared me most and the thing that had me quaking in my boots the whole time that I had this was knowing that it was documented. Everything here was in documentation. There are no buffer overflows. There are no things, you know, re no rewrite this in Rust and it comes back better. Um, it's just operating just Everything is just how it's documented in either the RFCs or, you know, the MSADTS, uh, MS Kyle, all these kind of documents. And so Samba 
has been doing these things because we match windows. Um, you know, this is one of these ones where matching windows exactly bit us fairly badly. Um, but real applications were using this behavior. And as far as I can tell, Windows, everything back to Windows 2000. And, uh, and the thing that always um, makes me wonder is sort of, you know, so I found this, but who had found this before but hadn't been quite so, you know, talking to Microsoft about it? So what was it? So I call it the dollar ticket. I combine two Kerberos features of SVU to self, essentially a Windows way to do a, an SU safely. We, um, Mets talked yesterday about the need to be able to um, use this call to get the list of groups um, when we were running a Winbind for, um, and also, and we combine it with Active Directory aliasing. Um, and the worst idea in Windows of machine account quota. I've already picked holes in machine account quota previously. Um, I was asked to implement this for a client many years ago, and I realized that machines could create other machines and that you could therefore create an infinite number of machines and worked with actually some of the same people at Microsoft uh, to fix that and to lock that down to 10 and then some level of uh, iteration below that, but not infinite. You sort of end up being sort of, um, yeah, 10, eight, each each of the the sub machines can join a few more, but not it doesn't go in, it doesn't go to infinity anymore. So we go back to this slide, and we have a fairly simple set of steps. And this is what, by the time we've actually got this thing out, this is what was scaring me: is how to get out a release that people will patch and believe and believe they need to do something about that without putting a set of steps this simple onto the web because this is all you have to do. We produced lovely sets, no, sorry, Joseph produced lovely sets of, of, um, of scripts and, and things, uh, but it really was just this, this simple. You create a new machine account and you rename that to be DC without the dollar. Now that doesn't conflict with DC, which is your domain controller because the demo controller has DC with dollar. So these two both exist at the same time. You get back this ticket, you don't ask for um, any kind of localization, and it wouldn't matter if you did. You've got it and it says DC. Now you, get, you take your, 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 your attacking account away. Now there is no account called DC. The ticket comes back to the KDC and it goes, well, there wasn't an account called DC. Maybe they meant DC dollar. Microsoft could have, um, there's so many ways Microsoft could have locked this down. Um, Conopolization could have been an enforced feature and it would have said, well, that second step, you're not allowed to do aliasing. But either way, it, but they have a simple routine, as do we. Ticket comes in, need to find the, the account, run the same routine every time. And so, so it goes and says, oh, you meant DC dollar. So you ask... Um, and, you, and, and that happens when you're asking a ticket to myself using that ticket. It's printed and encrypted to the, uh, to the keys for the real DC, and it's given back to you um, encrypted with the session key. And then from there, it's, it's a simple matter of downloading the password database. Because uh, once you've got a ticket as a DC, you can then just go off and do replication. But wait, there's more. So once we did this, this was enough to, you know, scare the hell out of everybody, but we found a pile of other things that you could do. So we were able to, um, every DC has service principal names. And um, in Windows um, 2012 and above, these are unique. But the uniqueness was done on a purely string basis. So you could go and ask for SIF slash uh, DC and say, that's my SPN. I own SIF slash DC, which then means that you could then spoof the uh, return of GPOs. Samba had some real lemons um, of the total failure to protect attributes of, um, there's attributes that say about um, constrained delegation. This user can go to these services and be anyone they want. And we just didn't have any access control on that. We had the implementation of, of reading it, but we didn't really think that someone who wasn't admin could be writing to a user. Uh, user principal names were not unique. 
And so this was just simple denial of service, um, also would have allowed this other attack even without the dollar alert. And when we were going and fixing in the service principal name and locking that down, um, I was working with Douglas and we were like getting his stuff done in good time. And then, so what about, you know, LDAP ads can have multiple operations within a single, an LDAP modifier request can say, add this, delete this. It's a little recipe. We were only checking the very first operation and we were checking it, um, the, the first non-delete operation. Uh, and so it was really easy to add in extra values that just totally bypassed all the checking. Um, we still have, um, you know, so this, this is a, a worry even to now. Uh, I think we've got it right, but look, you know, these are, uh, it was busy. And then just as we were getting to the end, I had a thought, a sickening thought. Where, how could I create a user in Samba without privileges? And I'm not going to say where, but there's somewhere in the, in the tree where it was possible to create user objects in a spot where everybody can write to. And so suddenly Samba's got, got smug, okay, look, as long as only privileged administrative kind of users can write to my uh, domain, then I'm okay. Just went out the window. Bother. Thankfully, it was a fairly simple patch, but hidden in that 100 patch uh, set was, you know, one of those ones that was very late and very, oh, shit. And then even more things. Uh, Metz had a set of RPC server patches that he really wanted to get out. If we were going to do a security release, he wanted to get this slot fixed. So those got tacked on. Uh, we had found that the REDC could print or issue um, um, the REDC could print or issue tickets. Uh, for any user, which is um, a little bit about how I found this. We fixed the bronze bit issues, which we'd known about for a year. And frankly, I don't think we're really, and we weren't worth a real security release. And we didn't do them as that. We put them out uh, for, uh, um, before our big security release. And um, we used them as cover. Um, so the... We did so many patches went out as, oh, we're doing this so we can test bronze bit. Yeah, yeah it's all about bronze bit. Honest. Um, the number of patches that we got out and got out and released, providing all the scaffolding for doing this work was amazing. We've um, we restricted the object class equals computer to behave much more like a computer, which means that when you give someone the ACL delegated right, because instead we don't have machine account quota. So the... It is genuinely reasonable to delegate out the right to create machine accounts. So that's locked down that, uh, as to, you know, they, ha they now have to have that machine dollar name. That makes them much safer. And we've also did work like restricting Kerberos three-part SPNs to be full DCs. Microsoft doesn't even do this. Um, but we make it that if you've got a three-part SPN, that can only exist on a domain controller. Um, and that helps the Kerberos security. So how did I find this? I'll stop and breathe for a moment. But always, always, what could possibly be going wrong? I mean, I never liked when Mets added this dollar alias thing <clears throat> that went in, and I was looking... I'd been looking over the other times that we'd been looking at that test suite and thinking, what could I do with this? But I was thinking with my Active Directory hat on, and you can't spoof another account that exists. Well, I didn't think you could. Um, you know, and you, you know the password. And I sort of originally was thinking, like at the start, this would break Unix-like systems. So I started a a conversation with Microsoft to see if they would do something to save the Unix world. 
And I asked for a phone call with Microsoft's Kerberos lead, uh, for whom I'm very grateful. I'm not going to use names of internal Microsoft staff who haven't put their name out there, because. Uh, but I'm incredibly grateful to the, the team at, at Microsoft that I worked with. And I worked with some of the, um, so the protocol team got me a, uh, a phone call with people from the product group. Um, and um, I also had started thinking about how this could go wrong using machine account quota because I knew this was the way you could make things more than just admins and semi-admins can do things. Now, thankfully, there's an awesome uh, web page that we've linked from the security uh, blogs. And basically, you look up Machine Account Quota, it's the first one. Uh, NetSPI published this page. And this um, had, I didn't realize quite how much you could do with the account that you got because of oddities in the security descriptor. Um, And so I was thinking, okay, so how do I do this? What, how do I tease this apart? And I was also, I'd already was thinking about our issue that the machine account can print any ticket in Active Directory. And I knew in Samba that we, um, we've got some, we always had some handling uh, for RADCs and doing, trying to do them properly. And I will say that uh, the, the read domain controller is a really bad idea. It should never have been implemented in Active Directory. Um, the, tr the, the, the non-trust boundary should have been left at forests and nothing else because this boundary keeps on being busted. Uh, but the idea is something which I'll show on the next slide, uh, that the RADC is really for this idea that you've got a remote site with an RADC that you don't really trust. Now, because you don't trust it, if, it wants, if someone at the remote site needs to access a privileged server, you can't trust their pack because they could just go and put in administrator in one of the groups. So Samba, like Windows, has to cut the ticket back down to just the name when it's being passed between the RADC and the full KDC. But that means you've got to look up the user again and get a full ticket to give it to the server. Now, Kerberos tickets don't actually flow where these arrows do, but it's easy to think that they do. Now, once you cut it to the name, you've got to trust the name. And so I was looking at Samba's code, and I was thinking, well, what if Windows does the same? And that's where I started. And I was able to um, come up with an attack like that. And I started, and so even before I got my call with, with Microsoft's product group, I'd already made a, a, an attack and started talking to MSRC about it. Um, and so I was able to show that I could get a connection as the RODC and that therefore, in theory, I could just download uh, passwords and things. But it was all, all a bit messy and I got my phone call. And basically, you know, and, and they come on the line and basically say, look, Kerberos is a name-based protocol. Don't do silly renames like that. And afterwards, I got the emails back with much the same thing, saying thank you, essentially thank you for your time. But the problem was that on the phone call, we actually had the total opposite. The developers were really helpful. Um, I mentioned some extra details, things like there was another name-based uh, comparison that was uh, that came up, and that was um, user-to-user Kerberos, which is this um, user-to-user GSS API, which in Kerberos is called something else, which always confuses me because you find it in the docs. It's um, encrypted ticket in subkey. Um, so Windows does this thing where it can uh, a server can come back and say, look, I don't have a service... Um, I don't have a strong password on my account. So why don't I give you my TGT encrypted to back to the KDC, um, which you can't use. But if you come back to a ticket encrypted to this with, with the secret key that's found in here, we can communicate safely. Anyway, so this, this um, the details is not so important, but it was another 
way this can, attack can happen and we're, and we're fixed. And so I was thinking, okay, it's going to be messy, but I can set up tests to pretend to be doing this um, network interception. We could show that maybe this was worse. But, and um, that spitballing back and forth, we were able between us to, uh, to realise that something did need to be done. And Microsoft had actually committed to some action. Unfortunately, there was some confusion and things, so it took us a little while to get going. But that stage, it was mostly spitballing and bits and pieces. Um, and the things I sent to Microsoft weren't really good for them. They couldn't really see what the issues were. Um, particularly if you were trying to do something like intercept, pretend to intercept traffic, or this complicated scheme with the R with RADCs. If I just jump back three slides, if I'm trying to write a demonstrator from here, you can see three different servers I've got to talk to. I've got to make sure my Kerberos libraries talk to one and then to the other. Um, we end up with a a need for something better. So I set Joseph on a task of extending our raw Kerberos test suite to be able to do all the things we actually needed for this. Um, we, yeah, I wanted to be able to control the canonicalized flag exactly when we wanted it. And I wanted to be able to then launch into full RPC or LDAP operations once we're done, not just go, hey, I got a ticket, I proved this. I wanted to be able to do something visceral like download the password database. And Joseph had just joined Catalyst and was getting his teeth into meatier and meatier things. And one of the things we sat down together and did was I said, well, how hard is it to write out a Kerberos key tab? You know, like the, the type that MIT and Heimdall Kerberos use. And we looked at it and looked at it. And it wasn't that hard to write IDL, to write out a single key tab with a single key in it. A second one was a bit annoying because of the uh, way IDL worked, but we could certainly write out a key tab with just one key. And this allowed us to bridge the Kerberos test suite, which was only focused out reading and writing just these raw ASM1 packets and doing the maths on it, to being, okay, use the, use the keys we've got. And this allowed us to build all-in-one exploit scripts. And the first thing that we would do with them was that we could print, we could go and connect to all that and ask it for the token groups. That gets you back the user's seed, and it's really easy to see who you've become. You know that you have um, that you've exploited the server, and you can keep one because you can put scripts into Git, and you can recreate the accounts fresh every time. You know that you haven't accidentally got in because you gave more permissions than you meant to, or things like that. And of course, once you print the password hashes, there's nobody can say no, it didn't really happen. So none of this would be possible without Joseph's uh, work on that. Meanwhile, I'm trying to move this up a notch. I've been looking at, well, what accounts you create. I was at this harebrained scheme about creating more read-only domain controllers that weren't, um, that, that were semi-privileged because there's this issue in Windows where you can create a, an account with the key, the, the magic uh, number thing that makes a RODC. Um, there's a MSDS key version number. There's a there's a there's an extra attribute turns an account into an RODC's curb TGT account. And it turns out if you set it to six five five three six, you get past the validation layer. Yay! Unfortunately, it always ends up with a random password, so you can't use it, but you get darn close. Anyway, I was trying to make this go, and then a flash of inspiration hits. And I thought about SVU to self. I thought, well, what if that's string-based comparison? Total domain compromise. I wish I had something even more, you know, um, maybe that, you know, that, that gift that it, this is um, this is fine, the you know, the the, the with the, the girl that looking at the fire, or I don't know. Um, it was once we made this work, because I, I actually told Joseph, hey, can you have a have a go at that. And he comes back, like Joseph does, with just having just adjusted the Kerberos things to um, to do an SVU to self. Um, I think we had some some bits of the test, you know, and it was there. And we've been struggling with getting Microsoft to really commit to what was happening on this. 
So we got this and we got it together. And then I wrote out an email with download this Docker image, run this script, and you know, patch this version sample with this patch. And we sent it off to them. That got their attention. Um, so this happened because the SVU itself does, needs to figure out, uh, am I the same account? And does it by, um, you can do SVU to self where the, the proof that who I am, my client name in the ticket, and the server name can be an SPN. That, um, and so you've got to do some database lookups. And because you do the database lookups, you then fall for it. Um, so it was very easy to, so once it all, um, it just fell through that same I'm looking up a client name to work out you know, who self was and then you know, check the aliases. So they pass the check and then you've got, got your ticket. Yeah. Um, I've never had an exploit to code that, was, that felt like I could take over any DC on the planet. Um, I was very glad of uh, some help from our security team and drafting an email to Microsoft to make sure we put made it as clear as possible what what we, what I had and what we needed to do. Um, anyway, GPG encrypted up, sent it on, kept that very close. Um, only a few people have got that. So, some um, so. The reason it happened is that we took a historically name-based protocol. You know, MIT Kerberos is, um, you know, it's all it's got is names. Um, as traditionally deployed, Kerberos is, as always, infinitely flexible with all sorts of name types. But the one that's used is, you know, NT principal names. And the, the concept is, you know, if, you, if you've ever worked with K-admin and things, there's just you, the administrator. An Active Directory added flexibility, this complexity, delegated administration, aliases, canonical ITs, and SIDs and PACs, and mostly worked really well on that basis. Uh, because if you, but that, that spot where, the, where it wasn't, it's not one or the other. So here's my warning should be on the side of the packet of Kerberos pills always taken combination. Um, so my warning, um, and I've given this warning to um, developers, particularly do, uh, to our free IPA friends and others. Um, if you have to allow login aliases, you really should only, you should require canonicalize. And with any system like that, you just don't allow the end user to choose their own internal identity. I mean, yeah, even for just basic human decency reasons, people's names change. Um, you know, you've got plenty. So ideally, you should have their identity being a number that that is that's not a problem to change everywhere. But if it is to be a string name, just make sure that it always becomes that name, at least in the you know the the realm of what the attacker can do. So that's my big warning to others from all this. Um, and I would actually like Samba to apply this rule. As a KDC, I probably wouldn't get that past Mets because he's seen he's had to deal with the customer cases. Uh, but I would love it that if you wanted to get a ticket from a Samba KDC and you wanted to use anything other than the exact name of your account, that you'd have to set canonicalize so we can go and print the exact name of the account in your ticket. So it's working with Microsoft. And we started this early phone call. This was about uh, March. And it took a little bit to get going. We got to midwinter and we got one phone call in before the winter school holidays for me. Um, I remember one where they tried to set up a call, which would have been really useful, and I missed it by about an hour when I just didn't look at my email that particular Saturday morning. I was trying to be a good Samba developer who actually has a weekend off. But ended up with fortnightly, then weekly phone calls, um, haggling of release dates. There was much pleasure when uh, Microsoft came back to me and said, um, oh, we, we just really can't make October. You said not January. Could, um, could, you, could you do November? We don't like November. No one, pa patch in November is low. December is nothing, but November's low. But 
you know, it's all right. Um, so we haggled on release dates. We co-designed the solutions. I really battered them about the SPN uh, uniqueness and some of the UPN stuff and, you know, saying, well, look, we're going to say this is a really big deal. Are you going to say it's not a big deal? That would be bad. There's a little bit of back and forth of that and, you know, they... Um, but this is basically the core fix. Um, so here's my Kerberos ticket again. We basically made sure the pack, the bottom of this ticket, was always required in a ticket granting ticket. And so once that was always required, you had something that wasn't just that name at the top, the one that was fatally compromised by the RFCs of, of, of being what the user typed in. We couldn't even fix that and just say, look, blow the RFCs, we're just going to canonicalize it because you would break a client that was um, that did as the RFC said and check that name when it got back. Because if you recall, in one of those first slides, it says you, the name must match what I sent. And you can't slightly change it on, an, on the ticket to the target server because there's another check likewise that these names match. So we couldn't fix it silently. So instead, a pack is issued every time you talk to the KEC with your ticket granting ticket, we check the primary user SID. Uh, it actually gets a new attribute in there called request to SID, but you check it against the name at the top. If these don't match, say because the user's been renamed, whether maliciously or intentionally, the ticket is just dropped to the floor and revoked. We also added in an extra thing where the SAM account name is put into the, the pack in a field that's easy to parse. Um, this, and um, in May 2022, the last of the things that I sort of reported to Microsoft came out, which is um, other people called certified. And basically, there really is no difference between this Kerberos ticket and an X509 certificate. All the same vulnerabilities apply. And um, you, um, they just they apply for longer because certificates tend to last a year. So you've got even more time to play. Um, and so they also get a SID, and it's basically exactly the same fix is, is, is applied. So that's, that's the fix. In some ways, really simple. Um, and we actually did get some, you know, I said, like, there's, it, the, the, everything's doomed for the MIT world. Well, I really wasn't hoping for everything to be doomed. Um, I worked... The, uh, the Kerberos community who wasn't in the room tell me, oh, I did everything wrong. You should have done it differently, this and that. But I did, on these phone calls, manage to get Microsoft to add in an extra pack buffer with the SID and the same account name included at the end of a buffer that's just really easy to parse. It's no NDR stuff because a full NDR library was really too much to embed into libcurb5. Um, and so I talked to um, Luke Howard at Heimdall and some of the MIT uh, Kerberos folks and tried to get them to include this check and have some way of, of having it on in by default or I don't know. You can't, but there isn't really a good way of knowing that I'm in Active Directory when you're inside the Curb 5. And no one wants to break an existing site in a security update. And everyone really hated the fact that they were asked to basically swallow Microsoft's lives, you know, live bugs, you know, going still wriggling as it goes down their throat. That it was that kind of visceral, you know, you came on my turf and you screwed it up and now you want me to add more code to work around your issues. That was the basic feeling I was getting back. And so I understand that there's some um, patch and unreleased time bill, nothing in MIT but there could be. If people really wanted to, to secure this stuff, we could try and someone with some more energy for trying to uh, work this thing out. I'd love if we could find a way to have a really good um, heuristic that this Kerberos ticket came from Active Directory and therefore it's missing a pack. Okay, if it's missing a pack, we should reject it. Um, something like that. Um, there's some other there's some other features that Samba would really like Kerberos libraries to behave in a different way if it gets an Active Directory um, ticket. Um, so we, but anyway, this maybe we just need to have the things that join Unix clients to Active Directory set options. 
either way, um, there's things here that could make things safer if we wanted to. Um, I'm thinking of things like um, uh, things that take passwords and Kerberos keys in for and turn them into SAML tokens like uh, Keycloak. That's a nice centralized spot that really knows it's talking to Active Directory and it really should be using the SID to map accounts to um, that come in. So as I wind down on a bit of this, um, I want to say how much, although I found it really stressful, it was amazing how much this release brought friends and companies together. I mean, this was a genuine multi-company security release. Um, you know, Catalyst, I say to say we led the, the effort, but the other hours when I the, the few hours when I was sleeping, Mets seemed to be also spending just as much time pulling together things on the file server side. Had great folks at Red Hat really step up. I, my relationship with people like Alexander Bokovoy um, is much, much better than it had been for years. Um, just through being part of doing this as, um, as he worked to make sure free IPA didn't fall into the same, uh, same problems and to make sure things are good there. Um, great people at SUS um, helped out. Um, and um, and CIMAS, um, we had weekly phone calls. Um, these are the, most of the people, and I may have missed, missed someone as well. Um, but, you know, Nadia, um, and I mentioned, um, Simas the last call. So as we know, Nadia is not a regular day-to-day Samba developer. She's a great, uh, great friend. Um, and I was like, we had, there's some bits of this that we didn't get to do. Um, we, in the end, we thought it was just too risky and we'd done better mitigations without needing her work. But she stepped up to get the Apple code to handle some Apple lockdowns that, that Microsoft did. Uh, they ended up doing it optionally um, and off by default. Um, and that was just a great weight off, off my shoulders. And, you know, her time was supplied by, by CIMAS, and they're not even doing Active Directory. Uh, Luke Howard was very um, patient with me. Um, included in some of the tickets. Um, <coughs> um, yeah, so, yeah, lots of good friends. Douglas and Joseph did a hell of a lot of work, um, working with Andreas, working with Samuel. Um, so, yeah, um, I want to thank uh, customers. So Catalyst's work was part funded by Univention, and um, this is, again, a, a story of friends going down to... Um, yeah, being uh, being able to ask a, um, a good friend, you know, we've asked good friends within the team for their engineers and resources, and Univention came to us with a little bit of cash. A catalyst to help cover <coughs> some of all this. Uh, so big vote thanks to them. You know, um, I reached out to Arvid and said, I can't really tell you what this is, but it does read on your products, and I really need some help to help get this over the line. Um, and so it was just awesome working with them and 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 their trust in me. Um, with me not actually telling them a lot about what they were paying to fix, um, we really, I really appreciate it. So I want to say massive, a massive thank to, thanks to them. So here's some lessons learned. Test, test, and test. Like we, the, the, this, I've never seen this number of patches go out in a security release. Um, and the security re and the regressions were only two that I'm aware of. Um, we missed still some extra checks around those extra att um, attributes and LDAP modifiers and things. Um, and we didn't really put enough care into the sample without windbind case, which more people use them, I think we would really like. Um, we worked really hard to get fixes out for those, but the fact that this didn't blow up in our faces totally and utterly spectacularly comes down to the amount of testing that was involved. Where pipelines running a lot, and a lot of, um, and this thing takes to within an inch of its life, and you know that I think is a really good thing to remember to do. I think we should keep on doing this pattern where 
uh, rather than going, this is somewhere vaguely near security, we don't mention it, we just go and say, well, it's not the core issue. We put out, we put patches into master with flimsy excuses, we get them out with CI testing and things, normal process, normal eyes on, normal reviews. Um, I'm so grateful for the extra 413 uh, uh, releases that you'll uh, help us uh, put out. METS did a lot of work there as well. Um, that flexibility was really amazing to help the rest of this all happen. Um, the, we did all this backporting and being able to, um, the tests and everything being backportable really worked in our favour. Uh, so, you know, we had, um, you know, these supported releases, but we did back to 4, 4.10, that was for Univention, uh, 4.12 for another customer, um, multi-megabytes of patches that were, by the time it was all done. But we actually got fairly good at selecting all the patches that needed it and it came together. It was a real art, but because the CI and uh, GitLab CI, we were, we were just able to hit things at the runners and come back and know that, yeah, we got this right. Well, you know, so let's make sure that when we're working, we always do as Samba team does and keep the, um, um, and keep it back portable. The other lesson I really learned was about knowing, like Samba, if you come to Samba with that, look, I think this looks really dodgy over there. Um, we will go and really look into it. But Microsoft really moves once you get a case file with MSRC, that sets up the right processes. And a full working exploit gets past their triage much faster than just, look, I think this is a problem. The second lot of this uh, certified that um, I'm really uh, good credit to the other developers who did that work with Microsoft because I just did spitballing. I was that exhausted and thankfully they took it. But, um, you know, it's time was lost at the start by not really doing this properly. Uh, and time, like, just like the, the time I don't have to finish this talk, time we didn't have to finish these, these patches. Um, you know, I, I did a, an estimation of all the hours. I got to November as being tight, but long as November, when they ask for extra time, oh, that'll be easy. Oh, I am amazed that we released on the same day. Our vendors didn't get 10 days notice. They got more like three working days, but, um, and backports came out two days, day before it all went out. But, I mean, Microsoft wanted to delay to 2022. Um, I wouldn't have had a summer. Um, it took me most of into early 2022 to, to come down from the stress of all this. Um, and I couldn't save the world, and I, and I want to. And I, I find it really hard trading off things like my personal well-being, uh, the corporate you know, need for us to stop doing this with, look, there are more things still to fix. Um, the, like, you know, throwing the MIT world under, under a bus, basically, made me really sad. And I don't, I don't like that. I like to be able to solve for everything. But we had just to get this out. We couldn't let Microsoft users or our users. So there's still outstanding work to do. Um, object creators have broad rights. Microsoft has an off by default Apple stuff. So Nadia did some great patches. We decided, look, this was too risky because Microsoft said they had some app compat issues. And hell, we had no way of finding those. Um, so we actually locked down the uh, service principal name stuff much tighter in Samba, and so we decided we didn't need to, to try and fix that via Ackles. Um, Joseph's got some patches for that. Um, and across on PKNet, uh, we now need to pass this, the, the seed from the certificates, if anyone's serious about using certificates with Samba, and I've got a patch for the dollar aliasing in certificates. Because, like, if you've got a certificate, you should have the user exactly as is. It's never going to have the... It shouldn't ever be machine without dollar in a certificate. I don't care about the other cases. We've got a real world thing, but you control printing that certificate when you minted it. You can put the right certificate name in the top. Um, but I left that embargoed because it would give away, thought it would give away part of the game. Turns out that people are smart. It's a smart world out there. So with 
90 seconds to go by my clock. Um, I want to thank the whole Samba team and everyone uh, who made this release possible, uh, Catalyst, and I will take one minute of questions. <sighs> Is anybody still there? I can't even see your faces because of the uh, way my screen's set up. Uh, um, so yeah, so that's, let me go. Um, yeah, so that's um, that's that's my year. <laughs>